America's only Irish station, RadioIrish.com, that's what you're listening to, and we're thrilled to be speaking with film director and author Morris O'Callaghan. How are you, Morris? I'm great, Sean, and uh, delighted to talk to you from uh, a rather cold uh, and miserable Dublin. Well, your new book, Morris, In Their Dreams of Fire, is an epic historical novel and is described as a reimagining of the Irish War of Independence and Civil Wars from 1919 to 1923, with fictional characters intermingling with the real historical characters such as De Valera, Michael Collins, Lloyd George, Tom Barry, Lord Bandon, etc. Talk us briefly through the gist of In Their Dreams of Fire. What will the reader learn and enjoy here? Well, I suppose for an American audience, the, the reader who may not have a full uh, overview of Irish history will get a complete overview of what happened, say, in the years of the Irish War of Independence and the Civil War, and those were from 1919 roughly to 1923. Um, he or she will get a complete comprehensive overview um, without necessarily the facts, too many facts, figures, or statistics, which uh, fiction hates, as I think they are. Author Ian McEwan said, fiction likes the, the grand story and the sweep and the emotion. So the American audience in particular, or the Irish Americans, will get, uh, if they've never heard anything about it before, they'll get a tremendous read, a tremendous sense of the drama of the time, the action, all the romance that was involved as well with many of the main characters. And they will get, as I say, a, a comprehensive overview of, 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 Irish, of how Ireland came to be a, a free nation. Well, In Their Dreams of Fire is a very large book, 225,000 words and 550 pages, and has been described by Ireland's president, Michael D. Higgins, as the greatest Irish historical novel of recent times. Indeed, the book was launched by President Higgins at the Mansion House in Dublin, calling your book the most important Irish novel for a generation, a perfect combination of high literary style historical fact, and fictional creation. Tell me, how important was that resounding thumbs-up to you, Morris, from the President of Ireland? Well, it was very important. Michael D. Uh, Michael D. Higgins, the now president, he actually launched the book before he became president at the Mansion House, which was a famous um, location where all the great treaty debates were held in 1922 and 23. And uh, Michael D. launched the book and uh, spent a very eloquent, nearly half an hour, going into d the detail of it. Called it a beautiful book. Uh, called it. He described it as working perfectly between fact and fiction and that it was the ideal example of, of what a fictional historical novel should be. So that was a, a fantastic endorsement, and I was delighted to, to get it. Well, In Their Dreams of Fire is described as a vast, sweeping saga, which tells the story of two families who grew up and intertwined in West Cork during the troubled years of the Irish War of Independence and Civil War. You were born in West Cork yourself, Morris, near historic Belnabla on the main Cork to Killarney Road, into a family of strong Republicans who fought in the Irish War of Independence and Civil War. Indeed, Michael Collins was gunned down during an exchange of fire, his convoy having been ambushed at Belnabla, near where you grew up, Morris. Tell me, how influential was this historical event to you, you know, growing up, and the fact that Michael Collins lost his life literally down the road? Well, it was it was certainly very historic, very, very uh, significant indeed. But more significant even than that was were some of the great battles that were fought before the Civil War. Now, our people, to some degree, didn't like to talk about the Civil War, which uh, caused brother to fight against brother and uh, friend against friend. But my father and his brothers, who all fought in the War of Independence, uh, didn't fight that much in the Civil War. Really, I think they would prefer to. Uh, you know, uh, avoid it, but they fought heroically in the War of Independence and were in many of the great battles such as Cross Barry. 
and uh, so that was a huge influence on us. Now the story does, to some degree, follow some of the some of the I suppose the tales my father and uh, mother told me about the War of Independence. Now there are fictional characters in the story. They're not based exactly on my my family, but there there are elements of some members of my family, such as my father, in some of the characters, and then. Then the characters, the fictional characters, do different things which my father necessarily did not do at all. But uh, it's just, I suppose, that's how fiction works. That you write about what you know, and you base, um, especially historical fiction, that you base the the events of the real events, and you and you juxtapose them with uh, fictional characters who, to whom you can then uh, tell their emotional story as well. Well, speaking of the death of Michael Collins, there still remains a question mark over the identity of the shooter Morris, with anti-treaty IRA fighter and former British Army marksman Dennis Sonny O'Neill seeming to be the most probable candidate. What did you learn yourself, Morris, in your research about who shot Michael Collins? Well, uh, I grew up literally, you know, two or three miles away from that location, and it was never, uh, nobody ever knew exactly who, who shot Michael Collins. Indeed, it was rumored for a long time that, were, that it was sharpshooters from his own side who may have come up behind him and shot him by accident or maybe shot him deliberately. There were all sorts of pros and cons about uh, what happened to Collins. But suffice it to say, there was a civil war in progress. The, uh, the Repu Republicans who, uh, I suppose, uh, fired a shot over him on that evening or attacked him didn't intend to kill Collins at all. They basically, their intention was to, um, to, 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 to basically put the fights on him, as it were, because even at that time, the Republicans were loath to fire on their former old comrades. Now, there's been various rumors about, uh, I know, as you say, uh, O'Neill and so on and so forth, but certainly... Um, in my research, and I have I've described that battle scene in absolute forensic detail, there is there is a complete ambiguity as to who would have shot him or how he or, who, or whether it was his own side or or, or or the people who were actually firing at him. In their dreams of fire is also described as a monumental view of Irish history and personal destiny and a tribute to the ability of the human spirit to rise above adversity. What is it, do you think, Morris, about us Irish that sees us, you know, rise to a challenge over and over again with that great spirit of conviction we seem to possess? I mean, we're not a people to give up. Sure we're not. No, but I think I think we're we're the sort of people who we almost have to be provoked in, into a desperate situation before we retaliate. Now... In the, by, by the time of the War of Independence of 1920, 1920, um, you had the Black and Tans marauding through the countryside, you know, and the people did not retaliate for quite a long, long time until they were provoked by Black and Tan outrages, and many of these outrages are, 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 are listed in the book. Um, and uh, I think it's because, um, you know, when we were finally, uh, our backs were to the wall, then we do retaliate and we do have a tremendous uh, sense of, uh, we, do, we, we are tremendous fighters, I think there's no doubt about it, but um, we're a sort of a gentle people on the surface, I would say. We're not belligerent in, um, you know, like the British might have been belligerent. We're not a warmongering sort of um, imperialistic type of country at all. But it, it's when I think our own patch is being invaded that we do fight, we do have the ability then to fight back uh, fiercely. Well, your new book is available on Kindle as an e-book, and you were also in negotiations with HBO to film the novel as a 12-part TV series for the 1916 centenary, which is very exciting news. Will you write the screenplay and direct yourself, Morris? At this point, you know, I've, I've directed another movie called Broken Harvest, and I've written this in my third book, uh, and I'm involved in other sort of business ventures as well. I, I, I don't know, uh, directing, um, I may direct maybe one, the first part, the first episode or whatever. I'm not sure if I would direct all 12 episodes of that. That's a very exhausting task. And I'm not even sure if I would even write the screenplay, but I would certainly supervise it, and I would see my role now 
uh, as more of a producer type of role, uh, controlling the, the financing and the production and the casting and so on, rather than specifically being a director of it, uh, certainly rather than being a director of the entire thing, you know? Uh, because if you do, do 12 episodes of anything, that's like doing 12 movies. You are also a lawyer, Morris, and graduate of University College Cork and the Incorporated Law Society of Ireland. You also attended Boston University in the early 1970s and sat the Massachusetts and California bar examinations. You have practiced law in Ireland and the United States for over 20 years. Tell me, have your law skills helped you to write and direct, Morris? given that law involves a lot of, you know, late-night researching and so on. Do you think your lawyer skills have applied to your writing and directing skills? No, I'm retired from the law for quite a number of years, but my skills, I, even though I did practice for nearly 27 years, um, my, my, my skills would, uh, that I derived from the law would be, in, I, I would say, particularly refer to my ability to, to conduct research and to take to complete a cycle of action more than anything else i think is the skill you learn in the law to actually complete a brief to complete a project to bring it to fruition it not so much as regards d directing a film uh, uh, from a visual point of view or even from a story point of view but f from the point of view of thoroughness and persistence the law is a great teacher for for any it's a great discipline for anybody to learn because it's very nitty gritty it's very boring at times uh, but Every job is boring, including editing a book. So, so therefore, that, those, that's what I, what I would have thought the law uh, taught me more than anything else, this ability to be, to, uh, to be forensic, I would say. Well, going back a bit, Morris, you lived in Hollywood, California, for four years in the mid-1980s. Your screenplay, The Soldiers of Destiny, received great acclaim at the Sundance Film Festival. The screenplay, which you directed as a short film and is now contained in the Irish Film Archive, was to be the subsequent foundation for the film The Wind That Shakes the Barley. Did you enjoy Hollywood at the time, Morris? What was it like? I went to Hollywood, uh, suppose, in my... I was probably... I was in my mid-30s at the time. Um, I went with that quite exciting project, which I had already shot as, a, as almost like as a pilot. It was a 20-minute piece, uh, which I had shot... Um, on a pretty much a shoestring budget, I, had take, I took it to the Cannes Film Festival, where a famous company called Cannon Films at the time had agreed to finance it. They asked me to come out to Hollywood to talk further about it. Now, when I went out to Hollywood, C Cannon had gotten into some financial difficulties, as a lot of these film companies do. So I was kind of left, I had to fall back then on talking to other companies like Orion, Columbia Pictures, and so on and so forth. Um, I spent nearly two years pursuing that project until finally um, I sort of had to reconsider the situation and do and revert to doing a smaller project called Broken Harvest, which I actually did shoot. But that was I shot. It took me about four years later before I was able to finance that, and that was about the civil war aftermath in the 1950s in Ireland. But that film, Broken Harvest, is widely available in America on Amazon, and it has been shown on every TV station in America, and you can still get it. Uh, you can still buy it on Amazon, it's been, and uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's widely, widely available still there. Indeed, Broken Harvest has been widely praised by critics, including the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and many more. You've also written A Day for the Fire and Other Stories, which enjoyed the distinction of being the Irish Times Book of the Year in 2005 and was shortlisted for the Francis McManus Award on RTE, read by the great actor Patrick Bergen. Then in 2007 you wrote the Celtic Tiger Meditation novel A Man Who Was Somebody. Tell me, what draws you into a story, Morris? What, what does a story have to contain for you to be keen to write on it? Well, um, I, 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 Sean, I've been writing stories uh, since I was a kid, and I've been writing, you know, my mother was a tremendous storyteller, and she, she could quote Shakespeare and Hamlet and, and all the rest, so she was a huge influence on my writing ability. Um, so I have tried uh, writing about, say, my times in America, and they didn't seem to have the same resonance as writing about my origins in West Cork. Now, many of the great writers will tell you that you have to write about what you really know and some of the 
writers I would admire most would be people like William Faulkner who writes in the States about the Deep South, Cormac McCarthy and writers like that. They, they would be amongst my favourites. And maybe Thomas Hardy, the English writer. So, but they always write about where they're from, their their native uh, patch, if you like. And what draws me into a story is to be able to recreate the the um, the, the see, hear, smell, taste, and touch of an actual place, and then. If I just have the bare bones of an idea, that's all I might need for a story rather than have the entire detail because I can fill in the rest with my imagination. But the very, I think the essence of it is going back to, uh, to, to the place that you know the best. Well, you're married to Gráinne and you have five children, four of which are at various stages of their education in Ireland, with your eldest son, Edward, who was born in New York, now a Top Gun fighter pilot for the U.S. Air Force stunt team, the Thunderbirds. That must be exciting, having a son in the Thunderbirds. It is very exciting. Now, Ed brought, as we call him, Ed brought, now, his, Ed was by my first marriage. Now, he, he uh, was brought up in New York uh, and, and, and raised by, 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 his, by his mother, Eilish, and uh, very successfully without a huge input from me at the time, I'm bound to say, but um, he, he's a tremendous success. He's, he's, he brought his Thunderbirds team over to Ireland about two years ago, and he was the lead solo pilot in, 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 that, um, in, in that team, and they, it was very exciting to see them flying up over Galway Bay and you know I, we were a very proud family on that occasion and we all uh, you know all my present uh, uh, siblings uh, his present siblings got to meet him again and uh, now he's married himself of course with a young family now over there because he's that bit older than my second uh, my second lot but um, yeah he's he's um, he's a tremendous character and uh, as I say um, he goes by his mother's maiden name Ed Casey uh, Captain Edward Casey so he's yes he's he's, he's He's a, he's a credit to to, uh, to, to uh, certainly to uh, to Elish's mother, and uh, you know, uh, hopefully to the O'Callaghan side as well. And so we're all very proud of him here in the USA. Well, we're going to enjoy a reading now here on Radio Irish of part of title chapter thirty five of your epic new historical novel, In Their Dreams of Fire. This chapter outlines the notorious events of the Bally CD massacre in Kerry during the Irish Civil War. Would you like to introduce the reading for us there, Morris? Yes, the, the, the Bally CD massacre comes as, as one of the climaxes of the entire novel. It's the end of the Civil War when terrible things were happening on both sides, especially in Kerry, which were the lingering effects were there felt the longest. Now, in this particular, this is a fictional recreation uh, slightly as well, because you have the fictional character, Dr. James Baldwin, who's not really, he's a, more or less an observer of the entire novel. He's really is a fictional character, but the the events of Bally Sidi are, are seen through his eyes when he ends up in that, he, he was sort of a wandering character through the story. He's like, he's like wandering Angus. You see, I suppose what I've tried to do with this story is to, I, I've really tried to, maybe it's pretentious to say it, but re, try to recreate the, the, the great works of Homer with all the terrible violence and all the drama. Uh, and so uh, he's like wandering Angus or wandering Aeneas, if you like, from the Iliad or from uh, you know, from Virgil's Aeneid or the Odyssey so he sees these terrible events happening at the end uh, when when these nine uh, Republican prisoners are brought out as it were to remove a mine from the road which uh, the other side the, the pro-treaty side have said has been laid by these Republican prisoners but which in fact has not it's, it's, it's a device that has been planted by the free state themselves as a reprisal and, and that is a well documented there's a huge monument down in, outside of Tralee to that, which was painted by a great French sculptor, or at least it was uh, sculpted by a great French sculptor, oh, oh, I think in the late 50s. And that is one of the great, uh, terrible tragedies that happened in the, in, in the Civil War. So it's a fitting kind of end for the book as well. Now, I'm not saying the book ends in, in, as a, on a downward note. As, as there's an epilogue to the book which ends in a very positive note when, when the two main characters come together, the male and female characters who are fictionalized. And I suppose it, it, there's a positive element to it, albeit, albeit um, you know, a, a sad and, and uh, dark kind of catastrophe side as well. And you're narrating yourself, Morris, part of title chapter 35 
of your epic new historical novel in their dreams of fire. Produced by David Dennehy. Let's enjoy your reading now. The moon is bright as they are marched into the barracks yard. There are two lorries. The soldiers keep their rifles trained on the men as they climb in, but there appears to be no resistance left in them. They go along docile as sheep. You come with me, doctor, says the captain. He is ushered into an armoured car with the captain and the driver, and the convoy moves out. They travel for a few miles on a long straight road. By the light of the full moon, the doctor can see the fields on either side. They are flat and fertile. North Kerry, he surmises, where the terrain differs from the dramatic highlands of the south. No words are spoken as they proceed along the road. The two lorries stop ahead and the armoured car stops. The men are ordered out of the lorries and marched along for a couple of hundred yards to where there is a side road leading to the right towards a wood. It is bitterly cold and the full moon shines down, reflecting off a small river that flows through the wood. In the distance among the trees, the moonbeams glance off the slated roof of a castle which stands still and sentinel in shadow and light. The doctor is marched close behind the men until they stop at a large log which looks like a barricade roughly erected to block the road. There it is, says the captain. Is there a mine at the log? asks the doctor. Underneath, says the captain, but does not explain further. Dr. Baldwin watches with keen anticipation, but sees no shovels or equipment handed to the men. Instead, the soldiers begin to tie their hands behind their backs as they stand near the log where the earth is disturbed and loose stones lie about. They then bind each man's legs with a shackle at the ankles and at the knees so that each man is individually bound and also bound to the next man hand and foot. The soldiers work methodically as if trussing beasts in stall or manger. Why are they not digging for the mine? asked the doctor in alarm. You said they were coming to remove a mine. The captain has a look in his eye that to the doctor is not a look of fear and neither is it one of concern. It is more a look of pleasurable anticipation. Can we have a minute to pray? asks a bound man's plaintive voice. A soldier turns and strikes him across the head with a knotted rope. I'll give you a prayer, you Irish bastard, says a voice that is to the doctor's ear unmistakably English. An eye for an eye then, so that's why they brought him here, as witness to a sacrifice of blood. He feels sick, his hands shake and sweat, his head reels. The men are bound so tightly they cannot move from their fixed positions in a circle round the log. That'll do, says the captain. Move back, men. Some of the soldiers move back through the gate into a field that rises behind looking down upon the road. The doctor is ushered back toward the lorries. He turns as he sees the sergeant who accompany him from Dingle, walking along to each man and removing each man's cap. Ye can be praying away now, he says. The sergeant turns to follow the others to the lorries. The men at the log stand and shiver in the moon. Some weep quietly and utter words of love, the last they'll hear. The doctor hears their distant voices. Goodbye, boys. Goodbye. Goodbye. He cannot take his eyes away, and he sees them try to hold each other through their bonds. And then the night is riven by the exploding mine, laid, primed, and detonated by a plunger in the hands of a free state soldier. Last, there comes a silence, surging back as the explosion surged out like the comings and the goings of the sea. But the natural order of the night has been disturbed. Rooks asleep in Ballyseedy wood fly forth into the air as if confusing night with morning, moon with sun. Dogs begin a tumultuous barking from farm to farm across a lengthy distance, but no human soul ventures out to seek the cause of the disturbance, though Gabriel's last revalle would not be louder. To sleepers in their beds, it was not the call they were seeking, 
resembling more the tumbling of the mountains and the crumbling of the earth at Armageddon. So they listen and they pray, and some dream terrible dreams, and in their dreams fire comes down from God to devour Gog and Magog and cast the devil into the lake of Gehenna, burning in fire and brimstone with this beast, this false prophet who stalks the land. The minutes tick by after midnight. Then there are looming shadows of soldiers converging from highway and from field, back to survey their terrible handiwork. The captain lays a hand on Dr. Baldwin's shoulder and escorts him down the road. As they draw near, they find themselves stepping amidst headless corpses, tibiae and fibulae of severed arms, legs, forearms, entrails and heads. A grotesque choreography that contains the faint voices of smitten men, some alive still and crawling, blinded and maimed across the earth, their bonds sundered by the force of the explosion. The sergeant, on hearing some dying moans, orders his grenadiers to pull the pens of their mills bombs and hurl them into the unspeakable stew of quivering flesh and brussed up bone until nothing remains but fragments where once were men to be scraped from off the ground and shoveled into coffins numbering nine, which they had prudently brought with them for the purpose. Part of title chapter 35 of the epic new historical novel In Their Dreams of Fire, there, outlining the notorious events of the Bally CD massacre in Kerry during the Irish Civil War. Produced there by David Dennehy. Well, what's next then, Morris? What stories are grabbing your attention these days? Well, I mean, people have said to me, why don't I continue this narrative and take it right back, right up to what happens all the... You know, a lot of the characters are still only in their early 30s, you see, when the novel finishes. The novel just comes up to 1932 in the epilogue when De Valera took power and, the, and Fianna Fáil took over from the Free State side. So they've asked me, well, why not continue the story? And what I have, an outline of a part two of it, it would be probably equally as big, but I would be inclined to take some of the main characters to America where a lot of them had to go after the War of Independence, after the Civil War, because the Republicans who lost, many were forced out and were forced to recreate their new lives in America. People like Dan Breen, for example. And many of them, you know, became, I suppose, security men and so on and so forth uh, in, in the Prohibition era. So there is a very dramatic uh, part two of that novel, which could be continued on and be brought right up to the present day, you know, following, following the same characters and maybe their children and grandchildren even. Well, and on that prospect, let me add that it has been a great pleasure having you here on Radio Irish Morris for our chat and I want to thank you for coming along and chatting with us, and I wish you the very best in bringing In Their Dreams of Fire to Home Box Office. Well, thank you indeed, Sean, and I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to interview me on this. And you can search for In Their Dreams of Fire on Facebook and join the Facebook page. In Their Dreams of Fire is also available from Eason's, Argosy, and all good bookstores. And, of course, it's on Kindle as an ebook, and you can just Google In Their Dreams of Fire to find out further information. You're listening to America's only Irish station, RadioIrish.com. In Their Dreams of Fire, The Birth of the Irish Nation, the sensational new novel by acclaimed author Morris O'Callaghan, In Their Dreams of Fire, an epic tale of two families through the War of Independence and Civil War. After the blast... There comes a silence, surging back as the explosion surged out like the comings and the goings of the sea. In Their Dreams of Fire, the brilliant and controversial new novel by Morris O'Callaghan.